this is your lecture about the periodic table and I just wanted to start with a quick review of the different groups on the periodic table because you are going to need to know the names of these groups. So this one is nicely color coded. I took it from ptable.com. This is a great resource to use if you need to know anything about any of the elements. You'll notice down here that there is a couple of new ones that they have just recently named. So we actually now only have four elements left in uh, group seven that are not group seven, family seven that need to be named. So it's kind of exciting. We might actually get to see an eighth row within the next 20 or so years. How cool would that be? Um, but so the group one metals, these guys are called the alkaline metals. The group two metals, they're the alkaline earth metals. And then you got these guys in the center here. They're called the transition metals. And we'll talk a lot about why they are called the transition metals in the future. And then you have your post-transition metals. They're just called that because they come after the transition metals, post-transition. Uh, but these guys, they behave pretty predictably. You've got aluminum up here that you get to use a lot. And then you have these uh, stair step guys right here. Uh, most periodic tables will put a stair step right here. And the elements that surround this stair step line are called the metalloids. And that's because they have slight metal properties, slightly non-metal properties. They're kind of a gray in the world of black and white. And then over here in this corner, you have your non-metals. And the only group, or there's two groups that you need to know specifically. And that's group 17 over here. These guys are the halogens. And then group 18, they are the noble gases. So you need to know the names at least of groups 1 and 2 and 17 and 18. And then you need to know that these middle guys here are the transition metals. Down here you have your inner transition metals, um, the lanthanoids and the actinoids. But we're not going to do a whole lot with them because at our level, they don't do a whole lot for us. So moving on to the different trends. We are actually going to talk about four trends that you can see on the periodic table. Now there's lots more than these four, but to start we're just going to focus on four. So the first one is atomic radius. And the atomic radius is basically a measurement of the size of an element's atom. Now because an atom has the electron cloud, and you guys know that clouds don't exactly have well-defined edges, what they do is they bond two atoms together, two identical atoms together, and measure the distance between their nuclei. So here in the center of each atom, you have your nuclei. And if you measure the distance from the center of one atom to the center of the next, well, that's going to be one radius, two radius. So you just cut it in half to get your radius. And this is the trend. We're going to leave out the transition metals for these because the transition metals don't exactly follow the rules like we would like them to. And so this is the trend of the representative elements, groups 1, 2, and then 13 through 18. And you can see that the smallest element is up here at helium, and the largest element is down here at cesium. Now, as you go down a group, the atoms get larger, and that's because... So as you go down a group, they get larger, and that's because of increased energy levels. Now, I know you don't exactly know what an energy level is, um, but think of it kind of like floors in an office building. Up here on hydrogen, it's on level one, so this would be like a one-story building. Lithium would be like a two-story building because it's on level two. When you get down here to cesium, cesium would be like a six-story building, so you would expect it to be really large. But if you notice, as you go across a period, they get smaller. So across a period is smaller. And the reason for that is because as you go across a period, you get more and more protons, and those protons are really attracted to the electrons, and so it kind of sucks those electrons in and makes the atom smaller. This is what just a general trend of atomic radius looks like. You'll have your smallest atoms up here by helium, and the largest atoms down here, this is francium. 
So, arrange the following groups in order of increasing atomic size. So look at your periodic table, and we've got rubidium, sodium, and beryllium. And they are all in groups one and two. Uh, so beryllium is in period two, which means it's like a second or two-story building. Sodium's in period three, so it's like a three-story building. And rubidium is in period five, so it's like a five-story building. So the smallest of these elements is going to be beryllium, followed by sodium, and then rubidium. Now looking at strontium, selenium, and neon. Strontium is in period five, group two. Selenium is in period four, group 16. And neon is in period two, group 18. So neon by far is going to be the smallest, followed by selenium, and then the largest is going to be strontium. A little trick that you can use to help you remember, you know, figure out which one's going to be the biggest or which one's going to be the smallest. Whichever one is the closest, the closest to helium is going to be the smallest, and whichever one is closest to francium is going to be the largest. So for our last example, we have iron, phosphorus, and oxygen. Well, iron is in period four, and it is a transition metal. So it's in that central group. Phosphorus is in period three, group 15. And oxygen is in period two, group 16. So out of these three, oxygen is the closest to helium, so it's gonna be the smallest. It's also the only second story, two story building we have here. Um, followed by our three story building phosphorus, followed by our four story building iron. Ionization energy is a, it's a measurement of how much energy has to be put into an atom in order to kick out an electron. And so this energy is going to be lowest in the elements that most want to get rid of electrons. So the guys that have the fewest valence electrons are the ones that are gonna have low ionization energies and the elements that have large numbers of valence electrons up at you know, six, seven, eight, they're gonna have high ionization energies. And so this is a picture of that trend. You see cesium down here, it has the lowest ionization energy because all of the elements in group one have one valence electron. And so it's actually pretty easy to yank off that one valence electron. Whereas over here in the noble gases, these guys have eight valence electrons. And so they have that very stable, full octet in their outer energy level, so they don't want to get rid of anything. And so it's going to take a significant amount of energy to convince one of these noble gases to get rid of an electron. So that explains why the ionization energy goes up going across a group. But the reason it goes down, I'm sorry, going across a period, the reason it goes down as you go down a group is because these elements down here at the bottom, they have lots of electrons. And so if you were to take one away, they're going to be like, okay, whatever, I'm fine with that. I've got plenty extra. Whereas up here at helium, helium's only got two electrons. And so it's going to hold on to those two little tiny electrons that it has with everything that it's got. It's going to take a lot of energy to convince helium to get rid of an electron. So general picture of a trend. Arrange the following groups in order of increasing first ionization energy, so lowest ionization energy to highest. So rubidium is in period five, group one. Sodium is in period three, group one. And beryllium is in period two, group two. So the lowest ionization energy is gonna be the one that has the most energy levels. Um, followed by the highest ionization energy is going to be the one that has the least energy level. So it's actually in order already. Now these are the same elements we worked with last time. And so you find strontium in period 5, group 2, selenium in period 4, group 16, and neon in period 2, group 18. And so again, the 
most energy levels is the one that's going to have the lowest first ionization energy. And so these are already in order. I love that, right? Now for iron, remember that we are in period four and it's a transition metal. And phosphorus is in period three, group 15. And oxygen is period two, group 16. Again, these guys are already in order of increasing first ionization energy. Electron affinity is kind of the opposite of ionization energy. If you remember, I'm going to show you. It has, I know it hasn't been that long, but just go with me here. Ionization energy was the atom plus energy gives you an ion plus an electron. So you have to put energy into the system. Whereas electron affinity, the energy gets released by adding an electron. So if you have a neutral atom and you add an electron to it, well then you're gonna get an anion and it's gonna release some energy. And so this is the general trend. This is from another great website called Web Elements. Uh, definitely you should put that in your arsenal anytime you need to do some research. And if you'll notice, the trend is generally up this way. Of course, the noble gases they don't really participate and so they have electron affinities of zero meaning if you were to try to give them an electron they're not going to release any energy because they have that full octet and so they don't want any more electrons but your halogens right here they're going to be very excited and, and release a lot of energy when they get one more electron because it gives them the electron stability of a noble gas. Now, you notice that this isn't quite as neat, as nice and neat of a uh, trend as the ionization energy was because we got some weird little dips here. And of course, you got group two that's sitting there with zero electron affinity. But the general trend is up towards this direction, and I'm only going to expect you to know the general trend, not exact electron affinity amounts. So, order the atoms in each of the following sets from least exothermic electron affinity to the most. And remember, exothermic just means releases heat. So, least energy released to the most. So we've got nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. They are all in period two, but nitrogen is in group 15, oxygen's in 16, and fluorine is in group 17. Well, fluorine um, has one of the highest electron affinities, so it's gonna go at the end of our line. Um, and then these guys just go right in order, so we don't have to rewrite anything. And then for aluminum, silicon, and phosphorus, they are all in group three. Aluminum is in group 13, silicon is in group 14, and phosphorus is in group 15. Well, the trend is that as you go up and towards fluorine, that the electron affinity gets higher. And so as far as this class is concerned, this would be exactly right. Now, granted, let me go back to our picture. Aluminum is right here. Silicon is right here and phosphorus is right here. So really it would go aluminum, phosphorus, silicon. But because I only expect you to know the general trend, if you just remembered it as aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, that would be perfectly fine. Now for if you get to the AP level, you will wanna know about phosphorus and that weird little dip in group 15. But for right now, this is all you have to know. So the last trend that I wanted to talk about was electronegativity. And this will be the trend that will come back to haunt you when we start talking about bonding. Because electronegativity applies only when an atom is in a compound, not when it is by itself. If an atom is in its pure state, then electronegativity is not going to apply. It only works in compounds. And so what electronegativity is, is it's a measure of how strongly an atom attracts the electrons when it's in a compound. I like to think of it as its hogginess value. How much is that element going to hog the electrons that are shared or given and taken in a compound? So fluorine is the most electronegative element. It was just given a value of four. Some scientists a long time ago decided, okay, fluorine, you get to be a four. 
and then everybody else on the periodic table was determined by comparison to fluorine. So four will be the highest that you find and everything else will be less than four. Now this is a very nice predictable trend. Um, electronegativity, you have your lowest electronegativities down here. Highest, of course, is fluorine. Noble gases, again, don't really participate in this, but you do have two noble gases. You have krypton and xenon. And these are the only two noble gases that will bond, and so that's why they do have an electronegativity value. Helium, neon, argon, they will not bond, therefore they can't have an electronegativity value. But, I mean, this is just a beautiful trend right here. And that, ladies and gents, is actually all that I wanted to talk about.